Welcome back. I hope that you're doing well with getting your COAST 217 computing environment configured, both in terms of where you will be doing your primary development and also getting comfortable with staging files to ArmLab and manipulating them there. I hope that you got something out of the first overview of simple file and directory operations on the Bash shell. Today I want to follow up on that with a few more common and useful Bash command sequences, some additional details that make for common idiomatic usage, and generally a broad coverage of what is possible in Bash without necessarily expecting that you'll use many of these immediately. I'm a big fan of the spaced repetition, effective frequency, and curve of forgetting pedagogy that all comes out of educational psychology research. If you see it now, and you forget it now, the next time you see it, perhaps you'll be more likely to remember it. If not then, then perhaps the next time after that. But before we dive into Bash, I just wanted to offer a few Emacs tips and tricks that can make it feel a little bit less like an in-terminal code editor and more like a modern IDE. Emacs is infinitely configurable, and here are some of my favorites. You'll know they're mine because uh, we're going to start out by just working through a diff between um, my .emacs configuration file and the one that you downloaded from the 217 account. Note that mine is publicly readable, so you're welcome to go look at tilde seamready slash .emacs and crib anything you like. So we'll start off with a bonus, bonus Linux command before we even start the Linux portion. The diff command compares two files and prints their differences that it finds. So let's take a look over here on armlab, diff tilde seamready .emacs and tilde coast 217.emacs. So it prints a bunch of stuff. You don't need to worry about diff right now, but broadly the things with a less than sign and arrow pointing left are the things that occur in the file that was mentioned first. The things with the greater than sign, those that have an arrow pointing right, are the ones that occur in the second file. And um, ones that have an arrow, uh, sorry, not an arrow, a vertical bar, a pipe, um, are ones that occur in both files and just seem to be slightly different between the two. So. Looking at this, the first one right here is about showing trailing white space. This is a setting that already exists in the file that you're given, but it's turned off. So as you see on the right, it's, um, it's commented out. The comment in the .emacs file is a semicolon. I know that's confusing versus C in Java. Um, so you'll see it's turned off, and I've turned it on. This allows me to show trailing white space visually. Some coding standards in industry require that there be no extra white space at the end of lines. It goes back actually far enough that a handful of bytes at the end of a bunch of source code lines could be a considerable amount, a considerable amount of disk space when that was in short supply, but these days it's primarily about version control. There are many editors that will automatically suppress trailing white space, and so if you put it in your file, you have a whole bunch of stuff that as soon as anyone else opens it, their editor is going to change those lines, and then they'll have a huge diff, a huge set of uh, changes that they've made when they commit, that it's hard to see what their actual sub uh, substantive uh, changes were. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Over here I have just a directory that has a bunch of files. This is going to be your first C file of the, of the year, but I promise you don't need to know anything about it. It's just some toy code that I took from a uh, old Piazza answer, I think. So when we open it up, these ugly red markers at the end here indicate that there is file that there is white space at the end. Note that along with this setting, so this is turned off for you, but I've turned it on. Along with this setting, though. Um, there is also built into the Emacs configuration file that you were given a, a, a command sequence, a, a shortcut, to remove all trailing white space. And that's Control X W. You can think W for white space. So if I do Control X W, it changed the file. I can see that down here with the two little stars in the, in the bottom status line. And all of the um, red marks for trailing white space disappeared. So I can save that, and we're good to go. Let's come back over to the diff. Instantly, I, I turn that on basically so that it reminds me, it gives me a visual cue that I need to run that control XW. Otherwise, I forget to do it. All right, the next difference I have is 
that I have turned on mouse mode. This is perhaps the number one gripe from students starting out on ArmLab. Why can't I use the mouse? Well, here you have it. With this enabled, Xterm Mouse Mode 1, I can click around with it. Let's try it out. I'm still over here. I'm going to use the mouse, and I can click anywhere, and it will actually move. This is not by default what happens uh, in your, your .emacs file uh, configuration. So that's something that you might want to turn on if you are a mouse addict or just find that that would be useful. Do note that there are some Windows builds that this seems to sometimes corrupt your ability to copy out from your command prompt window um, because the mouse is interpreted as being part uh, clicking around in Emacs rather than copying the text displayed on the terminal window. Um, but if this is ever an issue, it's easy to, to disable the command by commenting it, commenting it out with a semicolon um, and then restarting Emacs, doing what you need to do, and then turning it back on as, as you see fit. Alright, so that was mouse mode. Another common complaint is not being able to have multiple files open and visible at once. Certainly one option is you can open mul multiple terminals on your client, but this is still limited. You can't as easily go back and forth cutting and pasting between them, or it just becomes terminal window overload as there are windows everywhere. Luckily, Emacs actually has a really robust uh, uh, set of windowing options. Let's look at them. So over here, I'm going to use some other files at the moment. If we look at file 001, now I want to look at two files at once. If I do Control x 2 that will split my window into two separate windows. By default, it just gives you the same file that you have open in both of them. I can move to the other window with Control x 0 but hang on, we'll talk more about that in a second. So that was uh, Control x 2 to split uh, top and bottom. We can also split side to side, and in fact we can split within splits. So now I'm on the bottom here, I can do Control x 3 and now I have one on the top and two on the bottom. You can keep going until it gets absurd if you'd like. Control x 2 Control x 3 Note that it doesn't move you to the new window when you open it. Um, and also, as you get more and more of them, it becomes sort of fiddly to move through all of them. You, um, if it goes too far though, Control x 0 will eliminate the current window. So if I come back over here and I, I don't like this window here, I can do um, Control x 0 and, and remove it. And then the sort of opposite of Control x 0 that removes the current window is Control x 1 that turns the entire screen back into that current window. So, again, Control x 0 a little bit tedious if you look at it. But if you come over here and see that in the um, .emacs file, I have a difference that says shift plus arrow window switching. So what this means is that all I have to do to switch windows is click shift and hold it and use the arrow keys, and I can now move around within my windows just up, down, left, right as you, as you would. Um, personally, I think this is a major win over cycling through all of them in I think the order that they were created, but it might be haphazard uh, with Control x 0 So for me, I think this is a huge help. There is a great depth of other configurable capabilities for buffers and windows um, uh, and arranging and organizing them, but this is the big one of partitioning the window into arbitrary divisions. That's the biggest single gain for me, and frankly, it's the only one I really use with any regularity. All right. So let's kill that off. We're going to go back to our C program now. This um, toy C program, the first one of the year that I promise, again, you absolutely don't need to know anything about it. Um, you don't need to understand what you're seeing. You won't see the C topics in it for several weeks yet. So even if we had started C, this is more advanced topics than that. But I wanted to preview some of the IDE-like functionality for C coding that I have within Emacs that you might want to try out. Let's get Bub Dub back up here. All right, so um, first I tend to like having the line numbers visible. By default, they are visible down here at the bottom. 
this one comma zero says I'm on line one at column zero. So as I move, it will update. But that's a little tricky if you're trying to look at a long bin bunch of code and say, uh, it said the error was on line 63. I'm on line 52. What's 11 more than that? It's not necessarily easy to see. So personally, I like to, to toggle this back and forth. And the configuration your, uh, file that you're given, you can toggle it with Control X N. When I say Control X N, what I mean by that is type Control X, that is um, holding both of those at once, release thumb, and then type N. That's different from Control X Control N, which would say could type Control and X at the same time, release it, then type Control X uh, Control and N at the same time. So this is Control X N. That turns it on and it also turns it back off. All right, so a common inefficiency that I see from students is that we're, they're working in Emacs and they have to exit Emacs to go try to compile their code. One option is to have multiple separate terminal windows, just like I said before, um, but that's, you know, there, there are downsides there. Another option is to run the shell in Emacs, but that's way more of a power user move. I like the happy medium where I will compile inside Emacs. This is actually built into Emacs with um, the meta key, which if you read the, uh, the instructions from Precept, you'll see how to set that to an appropriate key. Um, you can set that to be, for instance, the alt or the option key, or you can still do it with escape and then X. That, that will be meta X, that's fine. Um, so this is built in with, with uh, meta X compile. But um, personally, I've set this to be control C M because C to me is evocative of compile and M is evocative of make. And also because not on every machine will you necessarily have single key access to meta. Um, if you're not sure why I said make, make um, is the make file and the make command that helps you build. Um, it's basically a recipe book for large C programs. And we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks. We'll see why it's relevant here in a second, though. So by default, uh, alt -X compile would do make minus k. So that would use the make file. Again, we'll learn about it in a couple of weeks. You don't know about it yet. That's OK. Um, but until then, you're not going to have a make file. And so doing make won't do anything. Instead, we're going to be invoking compiler commands directly, just like in 126 when you did um, Java C or Java C intro CS or what, what have you, but the Java C was the compiler. Here we're going to have GCC and in fact our version GCC 217. Um, so there's a nifty function, if we go back and look at this diff again, that says if there's a make file, use it. But if there's not a make file, do this other compilation command instead. Again, this is weird functional programming in um, Emacs Lisp, which is a dialect of a functional programming language that the Emacs people know very well and nobody else in the world can make heads or, heads or tails out of. You don't need to understand this, just this is a function that will do this switch off between make and GCC. So let's take a look. If I do control C M, when it comes up, it gives me this GCC 217 minus C minus O bub dub dot O minus G bub dub dot C. You, again, don't need to understand what all of this says, but this is a common way that we would compile a C file in this course. Maybe we wouldn't, by default, use all of these options, but this will work. For some more, uh, more complicated programs, we might have to change this, but this, again, this will work for, for the simple programs, and for anything sufficiently complicated, we'd use a make file anyway. So when I hit Enter here, the compilation happens. It goes and compiles the code, and the window splits to show both the code and the results. Furthermore, it drops me onto the first error, which I think is kind of nice. Um, I can edit the code here if I know exactly what's going on, but I can also um, move between errors. I can hop between errors with Control C N and Control C P. So we're still in this Control C mode, thinking about that as compilation. N and P here is just next and previous. So I've got a whole bunch of, of errors and warnings. So if I do Control C N, it's going to jump. In the bottom window, it actually moves to where that error message is. In the top window, it moves to the code that triggered it. I can do next again. I can go back with control CP and go back with control CP. 
To me, this seems way quicker than trying to go back and forth in and out of Emacs, especially if you have a whole bunch of compilation errors that you want to fix and then go see what happened and fix and go see what happened and fix and go see what happens. Here we can fix it and see what happens again right here in place. I see my error. Again, don't expect you necessarily to see it yet. We haven't learned any of this, but I see my error. I will make an edit right here, save it, and now I could recompile with the exact same command. Or if I go over into my compilation window, I can use my shift down trick. If I hit G for go ahead or go again, it will recompile. And so that fixed the uh, errors. There are still a couple of warnings that we'll talk about in a second. Um, so again, this seems way quicker to me than trying to go back and forth in and out of Emacs. And it's probably just as quick as between two separate terminal windows, especially since this will actually um, jump you directly to the line, which is useful when the code is longer than the five lines it is here. All right. Um, before I move on, I will mention that um, I said that this will work if there's no makefile. As we just saw, it will also work with a makefile. Let's take a look. Um, let's come over here, and actually I'll get out of it here. Um, so I have a makefile here. I just named it badly in order so that they wouldn't find it. Let's come back over into BobDob and try again. So at this point now, if I do the control C M, instead of doing that mysterious GCC command, there's the potentially equally mysterious make command. And so it does the make. Um, apparently make minus K puts white space at the end of the line. It's a feature, I suppose. All right, so this would invoke the make command instead of the GCC 217. Again, personally, I think this is a huge win. All right, back to the big diff of the .emacs files. This last one is autocomplete. So um, autocomplete, this is a completely separate uh, package that I have installed, but again, those directories are also world readable, so you can go and take a look if you're interested. So if you've gotten used to your IDE writing all of your code for you, you're not exactly in luck, but you can save yourself some typing and save yourself quite a few compilation cycles of fixing syntax errors that are just typos by having some autocomplete turned on. Let's take a look at what this looks like. All right, back over here in the code, there was this one warning. The reason, as you'll learn next week, is that I'm missing a directive that tells the preprocessor to add some code into the compiler for its use. Um, so this is called a pound include statement. And as soon as I get to pound in, there it is, it's pound include, I can hit tab, and it's there. Um, so uh, the, the file, the code that the preprocessor needs to add in is from a file called stdio.h. So I can again type it. It gave me stdio.h as my first thing, so I could hit tab. But if it wasn't that, I can use the arrow keys to move around and again hit tab to when I find the one I want. The, um, the configuration file that I have has all of the C reserve words and all of the common library names as potential suggestions, and the package also automatically includes all strings from your file, so that means it'll be able to autocomplete your variable names and other things like that. So if I change this to be something longer, um, not very much longer, and I start typing, it will again provide me the ability to autocomplete arbitrary strings from my file. So again, I think overall that's a pretty big win. All right, so that's what I've got to show off for Emacs, at least what I use regularly, but certainly in an editor that's arbitrarily configurable, there's a lot more out there. So if there's something irritating you that you feel like you're missing out on and that there has to be some sort of better way, feel free to ask on Ed. The course staff will share our collective experience and or ask around to find others with even more decades of experience hacking and customizing and borrowing other people's hacks and customizations can't guarantee you will find everything, but if there's something that's a real pain point, try it out. We'll, we'll see if we can, can make it at least tolerable. All right. So now let's switch over from the nitty gritty mechanics of one particular editor to um, more of a broad sweeping survey of the shell that everyone in the class will be using. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to stick here in this lecture to um, directory that has all of these mysterious text files and um, will, will work in this environment. 
The, the first bash topic I want to talk about is along the same lines actually as the Emacs content. It's a suite of um, niceties for working comfortably and efficiently in this environment. Um, the, the first tips I want to share are for people with whom I share one rather shameful characteristics, being an awful typist. So let's first learn some typo correcting magic and next some items that will save a lot of opportunities for error by minimizing typing in the first place. So I'll start with sort of an obscure one to build up. So if you often find yourself inverting characters, you can fix them without erasing them and typing them again. It's just control C, uh, control T, sorry. So if I do DC and that is a command, but probably not the one I want, control T will swap that to DC, uh, from DC to CD. I can you know, go back and forth if I want, but there you have it. You can actually do the same sort of flip of the words that you typed using Alt-T instead of Control-T. And it's even pretty smart. This starts to be actually a reasonable thing. Consider this um, malform pipeline. We're trying to pipe first into second, but we switch them. So if I've got second piped into first, and I go, ah, that wasn't what I wanted. Alt-T, and now I've got first piped into second. Um, again, that's the, the meta key. Um, I use that one occasionally, and I think that's a kind of a cool one. And if nothing else, that's one that, that um, when somebody else is watching you, they'll be like, wait, time out, what, what just happened there? So that's kind of fun too. All right, so with those as a warm up, let's talk about perhaps the one thing that, if it's the only thing you take away from this entire bash part of this lecture, I'll still consider it a win. It's a cousin of the tab completion that I talked about last time, and it's something that will save a lot of typing and a lot of silent fuming by lab TAs and preceptors. It's using your bash history. So every command that you type in bash gets logged. You can see that log with the history command. So here's my history command where I was playing around with Bob Dob and all of that stuff. Um, it's set up in your bash RC file that, that we gave you to store the last 1,000 commands that you've run. So that's approximately where, where we've gotten. You see that I've got to 1,000 with my last exit because that was the thousand and then as you work it will go beyond a thousand and each time you log in it will reset back. Do note that um, this is a little bit fragile there's a, uh, a race condition here if you've got multiple logins of uh, different sessions editing it you might end up seeing some of the commands from one session and not the other so don't necessarily absolutely rely on your history to be sacrosanct but more or less this is indeed a history of, of what you have done in bash. Um, also here, if you look as I scroll up, that's a lot of stuff. Um, so if you have it storing a ton of commands like the thousand we give you, um, you might want to limit the history to only the most recent ones to avoid thrashing your text down your terminal like I just did. Um, you could do this with a pipeline like we saw last time. History piped into tail. There we have it. Um, or history itself can take an argument that is a number you want. So history five. All right, so that's um, just using the history command. That will show you what's there. But if you want to repeat a command in your history, you have several options. There's a shortcut for your most recent command, bang, bang, exclamation point, exclamation point. And that will literally just do exactly what you just did. And it will, in fact, print out history five in this case, because that was my last thing. You can also do um, bang and a number where that number is one of the commands. So um, 1004 is supposedly a clear, let's see, and hey, it cleared. So um, that, that's another option. The, the bang in a number is plausible as something if you've, if you've run history to see what the number is, that makes sense. Bang, bang to me, it's too cute by half because if you haven't realized yet, you can just hit up and that will cycle through your history. So going up once versus typing bang, bang, not a huge deal. That being said, bang bang can be used programmatically, so that could be useful as opposed to the up arrow key can't be. Again, power user stuff. Um, note that this works even if you've just logged in. You can hit up to get the last commands from your previous session. More common though is that if you have a command that you don't want to have to remember exactly or retype exactly, but it's been a few minutes since you used it. You could sit there and hit the up arrow 10,000 times, everyone will be pissed off at that. Please don't do that. Another option here is that you could um, 
use that history command. That's, that's certainly another choice. Another choice, if you don't want to look up the history, is you can use the prefix of the command. So um, that takes the last command that you ran with that prefix, put an exclamation point before it, and let's do it. So for instance, the C compiler, bang GCC, that shows the last thing that I used that started with GCC was this compilation of the BobDob program. So that's one uh, next possibility. A more general form of this is if you can remember some of the words to the command but not necessarily the prefix, you can do a progressive search through your history. This is the number one thing to take away from, um, fr from this part of the lecture. You will have the lab TA singing your praises if you can do this. So control R will start a, a reverse incremental search through your history. So if I don't remember that it's Bob Dob, but I know it's a .c file, .c right there. Now, this was tricky because it was literally the most recent command. But what about something else? What if I do um, you know, exit, that works, or just IT, that works. So if you um, realize this, this works great. You can also continue searching with Control R. You can you can continue typing and, and expand it. We can also search with Control R, and we'll go back. So grep for white space in dot slash, in dot emacs was the previous command that I had done uh, with it in it. So that's Control R um, to to search in reverse. I find this to be super useful. All right, so that was the, the time-saving keyboarding lesson, if you will. Now on to some meteor topics about Bash and the GNU, the GNU toolset. Thus far, we've been just using commands because we know they exist. Um, maybe there was a reference somewhere. But how does the shell do that? How does the shell know they exist? Where does it find them? So we can use the which command to find the location of an executable. For example, we learned about cat last time. We can do which cat. And it tells us that it's in user bin cat. That explains where the shell found it, but not how it knew to look there. Where the shell decides to look is determined by an environment variable. Your environment is configured at runtime, with some default variables present and many variables set by the .bashrc config, uh, configuration files. Let's look into that file for just a second less.bashrc. You'll see on lines um, 12 through 16 a whole bunch of uh, commands that seem to be dealing with a variable called path. So an export command is, um, is a, an indication that I want this variable to be usable within the shell outside this file or by other programs within the shell. The variable then is, is there on the left side of an equal sign. That is an assignment, as you might guess. So path is, in fact, the variable that we care about here. It's what determines where the shell looks for your executable commands. And so um, that, that is where it gets set of, of the list. It's um, delineated with colons, as you might be able to see. And in this case, it's just saying, take the existing path and prepend to it some new location each time. So that's how we set it in our configuration file. What's in that variable? We can examine the value of a variable in the shell by printing it. We'll use echo to print a value. All echo does is it prints its command line arguments to standard output. So echo one, two, three literally just prints 1, 2, 3 to standard out. But the command line arguments are interpreted for any special meaning. And one such special meaning is that if we put a dollar sign before the argument, we mean treat this like a variable. So if I say instead echo the path variable is dollar sign path, now it comes back with the path variable is, and then this big long string. So we could look through this string and see if we find the slash user slash bin directory where cat lives. But for long strings, that could be tedious. So let me tell you another way. The command grep is a regular expression searcher that works on anything from strings to entire regular entire file contents. It's another of those commands that can take a file name as an argument, but if you don't provide one, it works on standard input. 
So let's try that out. We're going to do echo path grep for user bin. And indeed, um, the string is found, so it prints. If it wasn't found, it would not print. Um, when it is found, it prints, and it in fact highlights it. So there you go. User bin is in the path, and that's why the shell knows what we mean when we say cat. Grep is a lot more than this. Grep is incredibly powerful. It takes extensive regular expression arguments. Um, for example, uh, if we give it minus p for Perl regular expressions, which roughly match the style you learned in 126, um, we can look for things like t plus, that'd be one or more t's. And indeed, we find in Critter and Opt and Puppet and lots of other places. As I said, you can use it on files as well. Um, for example, we might find all instances of um, the path variable being referenced in bash rc. grep path in bash rc. And we can see that we have export path, all of the ones we saw. There's also export men path. That's a different thing. So um, as we get to having assignments with many files, you might want to hold on to this idea of grep as a good search tool. Similar to how Sublime has the nice feature of um, letting you search across all the open tabs, this way you don't have to figure out what file you need to be in before you search. All right, so that was grep. Back, backtracking just a little bit, I should note that you can see all of your environment variables using the printenv command. So here's all of our environment variables, of which there are many. And since we just saw grep, we can combine printenv and grep into another way of instead of just echoing path, we could search for it using grep. So we could do printenv, pipe into grep path. And there you have it. So it tells us that again. But if you wanted to use um, fancy regular expressions so that we get a unique result, we can search not just for path, but for path starting at the beginning of the line. And we do this with um, the, the caret indicator. And now man path goes away because path did not appear at the beginning of a line. I uh, note that the end of the line correspondence is dollar sign. So if we were looking for something that ends with bin, we can do bin dollar sign. So now let's backtrack one more time. We now know how the shell finds the commands we're trying to run, but there's a little more to it. Consider the command we just used grep. Where is that one? Here we do see slash user slash bin slash grep, but there's something more. In this case, it tells us that our grep is actually an alias, something set up as a shorthand for the shell. We can see a list of all of these aliases with just the command alias without any arguments. It shows us several, including, perhaps ironically, which itself, which is an alias that calls alias itself. The purpose here is so that we can report whether a command is an alias or not, exactly how we're using it. Mostly aliases are set in order to save us from typing the options that we'd always want. For example, standard options for controlling output. That's actually what the grep one does. The minus minus color option specifies to highlight the matching region, or for safety. For example, the minus i options on several of move and copy that we saw last time. This was what provided the, the safety or the cautiousness. These are all set by the .bashrc configuration file that you run as part of the materials from the first precept. Um, so we've, we've seen our bashrc. We can now go and use grep to find alias inside of dot bash rc. So we can see that there are specific aliases and functions, it says. That's where we set up the cautious ones. That's where we set up some of the color ones, etc. You'll note that not all of them are here. Our bash rc sources from some other files that have more setup beyond that. All right, so um, just for fun here, uh, let me note one more alias that I use on my own machine. Um, if I pull open a new window here, let's see how big I can make this. So I have um, this alias set up called weather that just grabs from an online data stream that my wife recently told me about. Um, so let's see what that does. 
Yes, that's right. I can figure out what the weather is outside without ever leaving the terminal. Of course, the fact that I want to do that probably means that going outside isn't really a thing for me. All right. So that aside, let's get back to um, more serious things. Some of our aliases you've already been using without even knowing it. Grep was an example. Here's another one. Consider ls. ls is an alias for two options. Minus minus color equal tty. So that says print some color if you're printing to the, the shell, to the command line. Let's compare what ls does. We have Bob Dob is in green, dot and dot dot are in blue, and everything else is in the standard color. Versus user bin ls, Bob Dob is not in green anymore, and dot and dot dot disappeared entirely. The reason for this is that the other part of the alias is minus a. So we said that ls has many, many options. Minus a says print all files, even ones that begin with the dot. Our configuration stops the shell from hiding any files for us, for better or for worse. To be honest, when I'm not uh, demoing for 217, I usually don't have minus a turned on by default as an alias, if only to hide the dot and dot dot of the current parent directory um, from appearing in every single ls result. All right, moving on. There are five more topics I want to talk about in Bash before uh, before moving on, and I'm going to cover the first four as a dependency chain. One idea depends on the next, and so on. And when I bottom out in the dependency chain, I'll backtrack up to topic one. So I mentioned regular expressions in the context of grep before, but we can also use a different sort of regular expression for the shell itself. Bash supports wildcards and globs. We'll talk about this in more detail and get back to it eventually, but this is topic one. To demonstrate, I'll need topic two. I'll demonstrate that um, a, a very tiny example of how Bash itself is a fully-fledged programming language. For example, I can write a loop in Bash. But in order to write a nice, concise loop in Bash, say a for each loop, I have to go down to topic number three, command substitution. But before I do that, I need a command to substitute. So topic number four. I have to sidetrack one more time the seek command. It's a simple command. We could do a man seek. It has very few options. That's about all it can do. There's a little bit of a description, but that's about it. So really all it is, it's um, printing out a sequence of terms between two arguments, inclusive. So seek 110 gives us just the numbers 1 through 10. I can give it only a single argument, in which case it will start off from 1. Seek 10, same thing. Uh, you can give it a step in the middle, middle as well. Now you may be saying, I know how to count, why do I need this? Um, for the record, you probably also know how to count backwards, but you can do that too. And notable for our purposes when I unside track, it accepts this argument minus w for allowing fix with output. So we saw what seek 110 did. There it is again. There's seek minus w110. It says, oh, the, lar the longest string is, is two characters, so make all of them two characters. So now we have a seek command. That's a great command to substitute. Let's talk about command substitution. Command substitution is the process in which you execute a command, and rather than having its um, output print to standard out, you save it into a variable or use it as part of another bash construct. This is a bit like redirecting standard output to a file, except when we use command substitution, we're going to have access to the results inside a variable instead of inside the file. So command substitution can be done in two ways. One is with backticks. That's the sort of inverted apostrophe that's probably next to the one key if you're on a, a um, QWERTY keyboard. Uh, the same key is the tilde. Uh, you might call this the grub accent. So we could do something like this. And we know how to see the value of a variable, so we've set x to be the result, the, the, the output, from running that command. Another way to do this in Bash is with the variable command interpretation syntax. Same thing, just with a dollar sign and parens instead of the backticks. All right, so why is this useful? Let's go back from topic three up to topic two where we were writing a loop. 
Here's a simple for each loop in bash. It starts with four. We've got a looping variable, the word in, so just like a, a um, enhanced for loop in Java where we would have four int i colon. This is the actual word in. And now we can use the um, command substitution to say, give me a list to iterate over. All right. Um, the the structure of a bash for loop then says the body is is um, opened with the do keyword, and then we can put commands in the body. So we might say echo dollar sign i. That is our looping variable. Output redirect. I know the file's already there, so I'm going to overwrite them. File dollar sign i. So now I can use the value of a variable inside some other string, and then the body of the loop ends with done. Again, not super important that you know this, but seeing it, seeing that it exists, possibly useful. All right, so what this does is it says for every element in that sequence 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, up to 1, 0, print out that number and put it into a file called file that number dot text. So when we do that, if we cat file know, 09 dot text, we have the string 09 in it. We could make this even bigger. We could certainly go even uh, farther and go all 100 of them. And we have a ton of files there. So we're looping over integers. That means that certainly there are normal loops. Um, we could, you know, check whether it's less than or equal to 100 and increment. That's totally fine. We could have. Um, but th this is convenient for, number one, it's a, a common paradigm of a for each loop, and number two, it makes it really easy to get the, um, the, the width of the leading zeros correct. All right, um, so this is a very small example of using Bash as a general programming language. It's usually most useful for things like this, text processing using a composition of other Linux commands. All right, with that, let me backtrack finally to topic one, regular expression structures in Bash. Albeit this is a completely synthetic data set, it does allow me to demonstrate some ways to select and filter among files. Consider, again, completely artificial, um, a question showing only the files here that have a seven in the ones digit. What's a reasonable regular expression here? Well, one thing would be to say, okay, we want file names that begin with a file, F-I-L-E, and then have two arbitrary digits, and then have a seven and then end in text. In 126, you use dot as the regular expression for an arbitrary character of the alphabet. In the shell, question mark is the single character wildcard. So I can say um, ls file question question seven dot text. And it will print all of the one with seven in the ones digit. Another way to do this would be to say, well, actually, I want anything that ends in seven dot text. I know everything's going to start with file, that's fine. Luckily, makefile and bobdobs don't have a 7 in it, so that won't be a problem. So I can use, uh, instead of the, uh, the single character wildcard, I can use the glob. I can use a, a wildcard that matches as much as it can greedily. And so here I would say star 7.txt. So this says match any character, sort of like dot star in the 126 regular expressions you've seen. So dot star in 126, just star the glob in the shell, uh, 7.txt. There you have it, and we have now, again, all of these files. You'll see here that it was a slightly different number. Why is that? Well, we had file 07.txt hanging out here. That was from our first run, where I said, yeah, let's make 10 of them. And then I said, oh, we could make 100 of them. Recall that seek minus w picks a width that is appropriate for its arguments. So when I only did 10, it created file 07.txt. Then when I went to 100, it created file 007.txt. However, with the two question marks, I already have excluded the just single 07. It was file, there's only a single uh, character, so that can't match two question marks. So that's, so that's one difference you might see with globs versus trying to pick character at a time. We can see this also if we do ls um, star 7 star. We might say, yeah, we know, everything after it. 
but this is actually going to give us something different. This says anything with a 7 in it. We can go even a little deeper still by filtering uh, using explicit character sets. Suppose instead of ending with 7, we want to end with either 6 or 7. We can put in brackets, uh, file, question, question, 6 or 7, dot text. And now we get everything that ends in 6 and everything that ends in 7. Um, if we wanted to, we can invert that with the caret. You're learning all kinds of fancy ways to use caret today. Um, we saw it in regular expressions, and now you're seeing it with the character classes. So this says everything that in, that's file, two characters, and then anything except a 6 or a 7 dot text. And finally, curly brace expansion, this was the square bracket expansion, curly brace expansion is magic in its own right. We can do the same thing we just had above. Um, this one takes a comma, which the other one doesn't. So there's uh, two options, it's 6 or 7, but it also can take an arbitrary set. I could do, give me all files that end in anything from 1 to 5. And in fact, we can do things with letters and other, uh, other patterns. And yes, that means that the seek command we had above to use the loop for everything, we could have done totally just with brace expansion. Um, so uh, we could have done echo, and I'll do echo instead of uh, putting them all out into new files. So file. And there you have all of the files from 000 through 100. And the putting two zeros um, right here was how I indicated that it was the same width. If I had not done that, you see it's file 0, file 1, and it only uses as many as, as, as uh, it needs. So the second 0 gives the equal width. Anyway, this is only scratching the surface of this topic, but hopefully you can see that these operations will be useful when trying to select multiple files, in particular filtering out based on a regular naming pattern. In fact, you already did exactly that in 126's assignment, uh, the last assignment, Atomic, when you used star to specify all the JPEG files in the run directory. Whew, all right. Very last bash topic, no downward tour of dependencies here, and it does conveniently lead right into the C programming that we'll start off with next lecture. So in Java, we didn't often care about the exit status of our programs. Normally, if a program crashed out in failure, we'd read the exception message uh, without caring what happened and uh, not really knowing what happened in the shell because we were going to go debug it. But unlike Java's uh, public static void main string bracket args, C's main returns an int. And that int should follow a meaningfully defined interface convention for Linux programs. So we'll have to consider that in our programs that we write, how to make that exit status accord to the convention. So rather than just relying on the runtime system to emit a value for us like uh, we did with the JVM in Java. So in the shell, an exit status of zero means success, and a non-zero exit status means failure of some sort. We could use the special variable dollar sign question mark to check the exit status. So in the shell, we can run two simple commands. True will do nothing and return success. And indeed, it returns a zero. And as you might expect now, false will do nothing and return failure. So we could do that, and this is um, totally useful. Um, using this, we could then use Bash's conditional operations like if then else, but I wanted to share uh, one last quick and dirty idiomatic way to do the same thing. It uses and, 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 or, or, the, the logical operators, um, for comparisons on the exit status, and it hinges on the fact that they use short circuit evaluation. That is, if we have a command on the left side of an or um, that returns success, Note, remember, success here is 0, not 1, as we would normally think of in terms of bits, um, and as we will soon think of in terms of C-booleans, then there's no reason to ever evaluate the right side of that OR, because the entire expression will be a success. We've gotten one true, and true OR anything is true. Thus, we can use OR to print an error message for a failed process. Let's see an example. True OR echo error silence. There was no message because true succeeded. On the other hand, false or echo error 
that prints the message. Because false failed, so we continued on trying to see, well, are we eventually going to get a true or not as we evaluate this Boolean? And so we had to run the echo. Likewise, if we have a series of ands, then the command on the left fails, we'll never execute the one on the right because false and anything is false. Thus, we can use and to abort a series of commands if one fails. Consider this you know, sort of made up example, um, true and echo one and true and echo two and false and echo three. So here we say true, now we move on, and yep, that is ready to print the one. Echo succeeds, so we go on and we do true again. True succeeds, so we echo two. Echo two succeeds, so we would call false. False fails, and so we stop right there. Whew. That was a big knowledge drop, all about Bash. Again, we're not expecting you to remember all of this, but if you picked up a couple of useful tips and tricks here, hopefully this was worthwhile. Good luck getting started on assignment zero. Um, at this point, you have everything you need to know in order to do assignment zero. And the first precept next week will give you more practice with Emacs and Bash. Then in lecture next week, we'll dive into C, and you'll be able to get started on assignment one at that point after the first lecture next week. Good luck.